Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And this is the first episode we've recorded since getting back from SVP, so we have about 7 million SVP things to talk about, approximately. That's an exaggeration, <laughs> but there are a lot of things. <laughs> We also have our first interview from SVP with Matt Barron, who is the guy that wrote all about Ornithocelida or Ornithoscelida, depending on how you feel like saying it. And <laughs> we have Dinosaur of the Day, Piatnitskisaurus, as well as some other dinosaur news. But first... We would like to thank our Stegosaurus patrons, as always, along with all our other patrons. But specifically this week, we'd like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Kyle and Betsy, Blaze Campbell, Trent Carbajal, and Para Laura Lofus. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. We will be getting our postcards out to you soon and our video from SVP. Yep, and thanks to everybody who sent in addresses and address updates because we want to make sure they get to the right place. If you haven't done that, then feel free to send in an address, because we haven't mailed them out yet, and we can always mail them out a little bit later if we get an address later. And if you want to join our growing community on Patreon, visit our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So we're going to split up talking about SVP so that it's not like three or four hours of... <laughs> <laughs> of talking about dinosaurs in one sitting anyway. And uh, we're just going to break it up by, there were four days at the conference, and we're going to break it up by day. And we're not going to be able to cover every single talk. There were a lot of them. And I found them all fascinating, but I realize that if you're not super into paleontology, like crazy into the weeds, <laughs> then you might not find them all really interesting. Plus, we don't really have time for all of them. And some of the talks that we went to, the work is not yet published, so we can't talk about it yet. Yeah. So we're going to start with Wednesday. So the first presentation that we saw that was really good was by Sander. And Sander talked about the medullary cavity in ornithopods and ceratopsians and how it became smaller over their evolution. Ooh. And the medullary cavity is basically the hollow part of the bone, sort of. It's like in the middle of the bone. And the really interesting thing that he mentioned that somehow I had never learned about is that sauropod long bones don't have lags, so you have to use other mechanisms to figure out how old sauropods are. But stegosaurs do have lags, and ankylosaurs have structural fibers in their long bones. And lags, if you're not familiar, are lines of arrested growth. So it's like rings in a tree, basically. So you can count the rings in certain dinosaur bones and see how old the dinosaur was, but you can't do that in certain sauropod bones. You can in stegosaur bones. And then ankylosaurs have those special structural fibers because ankylosaurs are the best. Oh, God, I knew you were going to say that. Extra strong. <laughs> it's really cool. They didn't mention any extant animals, any living animals that have that. Mm -hmm. So they might be the only animal that's ever had that, for all I know. Like little tanks. <laughs> <laughs> or big tanks, I guess. Yeah, they're pretty big. <laughs> the next one we saw that was really amazing was by Campioni, and he talked about how we estimate dinosaur mass using their bone geometry, basically. You can either use the circumference of a bone or you can use the length of a bone. And it works the best if you combine those. You use both the length and the circumference, basically of leg bones generally. And it was really cool. He put up a graph of all the different living animals and how their length and circumference related to their weight. And it's basically like a logarithmic relationship or exponential relationship, depending <laughs> on which way you want to look at it. But the coolest thing was he showed the earliest estimate ever of a dinosaur weight, 
which was, I think, of a sauropod from like the 1860s or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was right in the middle of where we would expect it to be. So he pretty much nailed it. And it was some super specific number, like (laughs) 38,652 pounds or something like that. And it was like just next to that line where it's like, we think this is probably right based on living animals and based on all the estimates other people make about dinosaurs. It's kind of on that like average line. Good for them. Yeah, really nailed it. It's kind of like we talk about Huxley sometimes. I was just thinking about Huxley, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's really cool. There was an interesting presentation by Bramble, too, where they talked about hadrosaur dental batteries. And if you recall, dental batteries are like these massive collections of teeth that hadrosaurs have. And they can have over a thousand teeth in their mouth at one time. They're constantly replacing them, too, right? Yeah. And it's... It's crazy because it basically wears down into like a giant flat surface. So it's like a grinding stone kind of thing, like a mortar and pestle or something. (laughs) But it's all teeth that are just like slowly wearing down. And actually the way it works is there's a socket and it'll have multiple teeth in it. It can have up to like four teeth in it. And you can even have more than one tooth erupted meaning sticking out of the gum at the same time. So what happens is they kind of grow in from the front and they push teeth out up and back. So like there'll be a tooth coming out while the top one is getting worn down to nothing and then a new one will come in in front. That's kind of like a conveyor belt for their teeth, right? It's like a one-way conveyor belt. (laughs) Well, yeah. It's like a conveyor belt with a cliff at the end (laughs) because then the teeth get like worn away to nothing, which seems like it would be really painful, but they must not have had real sensitivity in their teeth to be able to handle that. But it was pretty cool. And they showed all these details about how exactly those dental batteries worked and how you can see, depending on the angle of where the teeth are going, how old the dinosaur is and various other details. So that was pretty interesting. So you can tell by lags and teeth and age of a dinosaur. Yeah, it all helps. I guess the more information, the better. Yeah. The good thing about teeth is that it's really easy to find generally because they all lose teeth all the time. So... There were a lot of talks about teeth just because in some areas, that's all we have. Mm -hmm. It's like footprints and teeth. (laughs) So you work with what you got. We covered Lemusaurus a while ago, and that's that crazy dinosaur that as it grew up, lost teeth. (laughs) So it went from having a beak with teeth as a a child, basically. And then when it was an adult, it just had a toothless beak. Totally different lifestyle. Yeah. And probably a different diet and all that kind of stuff. And... Wang presented on how modern birds might have lost teeth as adults as well before they switched to beaks at all ages. And by modern birds, I'd basically just mean flying birds. (laughs) So they might have also gone through a stage where it had this ontogenetic change, they call it. And ontogeny is basically how things change as you grow up. Whereas, you know, there's phylogenetic change and other sorts of evolutionary change where it actually changes between species or within a group of animals as they evolve. So but this is just within a lifetime. Yeah. So they think that birds a few to tens of millions of years ago, that when they were born had a bunch of teeth mm. and then as adults didn't have any teeth, which would be kind of terrifying. A little bit. Although, doesn't that mean the beaks are more efficient and maybe more deadly? I don't know. I mean, I think they're more efficient. One of the reasons people have given in the past for beaks is that it's simpler and I think lighter than having teeth. Although the teeth they had were so tiny, I kind of would guess that it has more to do with their diet. Mm. I'm not sure. We're going to have to Evo Devo a bird with teeth and see how well it does versus a bird without teeth. (laughs) I don't really want to see a bird with teeth. (laughs) It'd be pretty cool. The next talk was definitely one of the highlights of SVP. It was Thomas Carr, who was talking about how T-Rex didn't have lips. And it got a ton of press when he originally published it. And all the dinosaur talks tended to be in the same room each day. So we were in the dinosaur talk room, obviously. And the room just filled up with tons of people. It was like standing room only, all the chairs. I think there were 200 seats in the room all filled. Mm -hmm. People standing all the way down the sides of the room and everything. It was packed. And it's not surprising because everyone loves T-Rex. But... (laughs) This was such a great presentation because what Thomas Carr did is he goes up and he talks a little bit about how he doesn't think T-Rex had lips and he thinks they had scales. And then he goes, 
I've gotten a lot of responses and feedback from this. And here's one email <laughs> that somebody sent me with, you know, various arguments about why I'm wrong. And then he proceeds to go through point by point in that email why he's still right. <laughs> It was an entertaining talk. <laughs> it was really entertaining because a lot of these talks, you know, they're really interesting if you know all the minutia of paleontology and they'll talk about, oh, there's this, you know, certain process on a bone and it's basically a small bump, which means that it's a different species from some other species. And some people spend their entire talk just focusing on these little details of bones. But when you get into this kind of gossipy <laughs> kind of talks. It really kind of lightens the mood and makes it a little more entertaining. But basically the points that he was going after were, for one, like we've talked about before, saliva improves the lifespan of teeth. So there's a whole cycle of calcium that goes around in saliva and it basically keeps your teeth healthy. So there have been a lot of people that argued that dinosaurs needed to keep their teeth wet so that they didn't decay over time. And what Thomas Carr pointed out is that tyrannosaurs lost their teeth all the time. You know, an average tooth, they estimate, was between like one and two years before it would fall out of their mouth. So if you imagine if you got a new set of teeth every one to two years, you probably wouldn't worry that much about it. I mean, there are kids that like don't brush their teeth at all because their parents are like, well, it doesn't matter. You know, you're going to lose these teeth in a few years. And those kids have their teeth for like 10 years and don't have any problems. So just one or two years should be fine. So it makes sense that T-Rex might not have had to worry too much about its teeth being in perfect shape all the time. If they're just going to get replaced anyway. The other part of it was he showed a graph, which is what kind of the critics have cited as a reason for why, you know, wet teeth live longer, <laughs> perform better, can handle stress better than dry teeth. And he put up the raw data and it basically showed that a completely dry tooth is about 10% more brittle than a tooth that's properly salivated, <laughs> however you describe it. <laughs> it's a good way to describe it. Yeah, so that's really not much of a difference when you think about it. If it's still 90% as strong, you know, that's that might be plenty strong. It's hard to say. And it kind of quickly falls off. Once a tooth is dry for more than an hour or two, it basically doesn't get any weaker if it's out of the mouth or out of the range of saliva <laughs> for like a month, it kind of comes to a quick asymptote. So he was arguing that drying out might not be such a big deal. He also pointed out that alligators spend quite a bit of time on dry land when they're hanging out near their nest, I guess. I think he said that they can spend a couple months outside of the water. And that was a common argument for why alligators don't have this problem is because they're semi-aquatic, so their teeth are wet just from being in the water. But if they're not in the water. Yeah. So he's arguing that, well, while they're not in the water, you know, they would be vulnerable, but maybe, you know, they're just vulnerable while they're not in the water. It's kind of hard to say based on that. He also argued that T-Rex was constantly damaging its teeth because of its super like rough <laughs> lifestyle and the way that it was chomping through bone and all that. Yeah. And the fact that we find broken teeth all the time, which seems kind of strange because on the one hand, he's kind of arguing that... The teeth are healthy. Yeah, the teeth are not that brittle. And then he's pointing out that they break all the time. But that actually could be a good argument. They're kind of opposed, but if you say that they're more brittle because they're dry, and then he says, okay, well, they're always broken, so I guess they are more brittle, and therefore they don't have saliva. <laughs> oh, so, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but it, they kind of contradict a tiny bit. I think he was also just saying that you would need to replace them really regularly in order to handle that sort of like brutal lifestyle, and if you have to replace them all the time anyway, mm -hmm. you're probably not worrying about keeping them around for a decade or two. Well, they're also probably getting damaged by bacteria, right? Yeah, it could be. I mean, once you don't have the saliva there protecting them, they can have all sorts of problems. They had that septic bite. I think that's just a theory. Oh, yeah. Probably because Komodo dragons kind of do. The last point was like the most anatomical point, which was basically about how they have these canals for their nerves that go through their bone towards the surface 
by like their jaw and they argue that that was for heat sensitivity and you know there was all that stuff about t-rex being a sensitive lover <laughs> that came out of the press for this paper and apparently the argument against that was that lots of dinosaurs have similar canals and they're not that similar to the ones that we see in alligators but he basically said i think they are similar and i think that was the last point that he made I think it broke down into those four points, basically. And that was the end of the talk, effectively. <laughs> that was only 15 minutes. Yeah. It was kind of like the second half or maybe the third third of a debate going back and forth, just very public. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked to a few people after his talk that were like, yeah, that was interesting. So it's still, he didn't settle the debate and satisfy all the critics with that style of argument <laughs> but the conversation continues yeah and i think he did a good job addressing at least those concerns there were also talks by both button and buller about dinosaur beaks partly bird beaks <laughs> and they were really looking at how you can see on the bone what kind of beak the dinosaur might have had and trying to estimate how far out the beak stuck from the bone there's a lot of that kind of talk in this conference in general about kind of inferring what kind of soft tissue or what type of keratin was on top of the bone based on the bone characteristics. That was pretty interesting. It makes sense. It gives you a better idea of what the dinosaur actually looked like. Yeah, for sure. We talk about that a lot with claws too and how the claws were actually bigger than just the bones make you think because they had those keratin sheaths on them. Which is crazy because they're already huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really cool. I think about that every time I look at our Allosaurus claw. Mm -hmm. Would not want to be anywhere near that guy. <laughs> no. And that was basically it for Wednesday. It was kind of a slow start to the week in terms of dinosaur news, but it definitely ramps up <laughs> as the week goes on. So we'll be covering more in the next couple of weeks, as well as some more interviews, hopefully. A couple comments about SVP. The show was quite a bit smaller than it was last year. There were about 1,000 people compared with about 1,400 last year. And that was probably because it was done in August while a lot of the people were still in the field. And there were even a few people that missed their talks because they were out in the field doing work. Or a lot of people teach and now is the time school starts, so it was hard to get away. Yeah, whereas if you're mid semester or something it might be a little easier than missing the first week <laughs> well sometimes you get that fall break around october too oh that could be this year it was in calgary alberta canada and next year it's going to be in albuquerque new mexico in the u.s and i kind of wonder if that's to try to draw the really big crowd since that's not too far from salt lake city when they had that huge crowd <laughs> maybe it's also going to be in late october i think october 17th it starts so it might be easier for more people to come. Yeah, less of the dinosaur region will be accessible, start to get covered in snow around that time of year. We also got a chance to visit the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Oh, that was great. Yeah, on Tuesday. And it really wasn't that far. It seemed farther than it was. It's only about an hour and a half away, basically down a perfectly straight road. With I, some hills. Yeah. The Royal Tyrrell Museum had an awesome new full exhibit. It wasn't just Borealopelta. They actually had a whole room that included a bunch of finds from Alberta. And I think they were all like accidental finds from during construction projects and similar sorts of activities, which is how Borealopelta was found in a quarry. And one of the coolest things in there actually wasn't a dinosaur. It's a plesiosaur that's laying like a penguin sliding on its belly <laughs> on like the Antarctic shelf or something. It looks really great. And of course, we got a chance to go through all of the rest of the dinosaur exhibits, which are always awesome, like Black Beauty and a Gorgosaurus that's really cool looking. And of course, there's the hall of all the really cool dinosaur replicas, which are super amazing. And the fossil lab preparation. Oh yeah, that's cool to see too. Mm -hmm. And they were doing tours while we were there, although we didn't sign up for the tour. We just came on our own. We just came and stared at the Borealia Pelta. Yeah, we were in that room for quite a while. <laughs> and we took a little video that we put up on Facebook, too. Yeah, you may have seen it. That's true. <laughs> from what I heard from 
other people at the conference when they went to the Royal Tarot at some point during the week. They all kind of s- stared at it for an hour or two. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. And they have it in this glass case so you can get really close to it and you can kind of see it from all the different angles. I was joking about if I could do photogrammetry on it from walking around <laughs> the case, but I don't think you could quite get all the angles you'd need. <laughs> There's a replica of the skull you can touch. Yeah, that was really awesome. I also want to mention in our trip to the Royal Tyrrell afterwards, we went to downtown Drumheller because we wanted to see what the status was on renaming the streets. Uh, we reported a few weeks back there was there was a vote to rename the streets in downtown after dinosaurs. I think it was Albertosaurus was the most popular one. Yep. But they haven't done it yet. But we did get a chance to take some pictures with some of the many, many dinosaurs around town. Yep. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. And... We also got a chance to meet a bunch of our listeners, as well as just other paleontologists like Marky and Janice and Ali, Keegan, Gabe, and Carrie. And there's a bunch more, and we're actually going to be following up with a lot of them for interviews in the future, so stay tuned. Yeah. We also had a break in between talks at lunch, and we got to go to this Women in Paleo luncheon, which was, the room was jam-packed. Yeah. I don't think everyone even got lunch. <laughs> yeah. There's so many people. Although a bunch of food showed up right at the end. Yeah. So if you were hungry, you could get food. Which is what I did. And patient. Yes. And it was interesting. There were two different talks. The first one was by Darren Tanky, and he gave kind of the life stories of some very famous women in paleontology or women who have helped advance the field of paleontology. Yeah. And the second talk, there was a lot of data that showed the disparity between men and women in paleontology and science in general, I think. Yep. The wage gap is still very much a thing in paleontology. It's a thing in most fields. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) Yeah. So it was nice to see so many people there. And now on to non-SVP news. First... Thank you to Brendan, Michelle, George, Sage, and Mitchell, who shared this one with us via Facebook. A triceratops skull has been found near Denver, Colorado, by workers building a new public safety building in Thornton, and that's near Denver. So it's one of probably only three triceratops skulls that have been found in the area, and it's exciting and unusual because most fossils found there are from the Ice Age. And eventually, scientists hope to have the skull in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. They've also found part of the frill, ribs, vertebrae, and a second horn. And there's one news site that reported that a four-year-old Killian was so excited to hear this news that he wants to learn about dinosaurs and dig them up. So his family got him some dinosaur and fossil books from the library, and he's been digging in his backyard. And so far, only finding worms and insects. But (laughs) (laughs) it's good that it inspired somebody so much. That's how you were when you were a kid. That's true. Digging in random places for fossils. <laughs> yeah, and, and only finding dirt. He's found more than I've ever found. You never found a worm? No, I don't think so. Were you just digging in sandboxes? No, it was my school. It was being constructed, so we were in these temporary trailer type things on dirt, hmm. basically. And the dirt, the way it was packed, to me, as a like eight or nine year old kid, looked like maybe that's the shape of a fossil. But in my case, somebody had recently found a whale fossil nearby, and then I thought, well, if there's a whale, maybe there's uh, a dinosaur because he has M8. I didn't know. So it was like <laughs> construction dirt. It wasn't the kind of dirt that anything lives in. Yeah. Gotcha. Next, volunteers who helped dig for fossils for the North Dakota Geological Survey found two big T-Rex teeth, and the teeth are two and a half inches or 6.3 centimeters and four and a half inches or 11.4 centimeters long. And paleontologists are hoping that they find a partial T-Rex skeleton. So far, only one partial T-Rex skeleton has been found in North Dakota. In Tumblr Ridge in British Columbia, paleontologists have found a new dinosaur track, and it's made by... Some sort of quadrupedal dinosaur, probably a ceratopsian, but it's not clear yet which one. In Seattle, Washington, visitors to the Burke Museum can see paleontologists prepare a T-Rex skull. Bruce Crowley from there and others will be working inside the museum, and apparently it's only the 15th T-Rex skull found so far. I was surprised when I read that. Well, it's cool that they are starting on that, because I remember when they had the jacketed fossil in the museum, and they were talking about working on it. 
Yeah, and they recently had a talk at the museum from people who are helping prepare it and who helped excavate it. And I guess the T-Rex is nicknamed Tufts Love Rex, T-U-F-T-S. And it's in honor of Jason Love and Luke Tufts, who are the two volunteers who discovered it. That's funny. Sounds like tough love. Yeah. (laughs) I like that you can see them prepare it. That always makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. Probably attracts more visitors, too. True. That's probably why they do it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Next, thanks to Luke, who shared this one with us via Patreon. So Luke is one of the Jurassic enthusiasts behind the site Jurassic Files. And one of their latest posts is about St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site at Johnson Farms in St. George, Utah. And Luke spoke with Andrew Milner, a city paleontologist and curator at the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site. I'd never heard of a city paleontologist before, but that's that's pretty cool. And the article goes into Milner's background and a history of the park, which was discovered in 2000 by retired ophthalmologist Sheldon Johnson. Over 6,000 tracks have been recorded and mapped on the site. I know. And they have the largest collection of skin impressions preserved on dinosaur tracks. That's pretty cool. Yeah. The article covers a whole lot more cool facts about the site, and we'll post a link so you can read it yourself. That is a lot of tracks, man. Yeah, it is. The American Museum of Natural History has published archival footage of Roy Chapman Andrews' expeditions to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia in the 1920s, and I really enjoyed watching it. It's maybe four or five minutes long, and it shows a group of them walking around the cliffs and uncovering a protoceratops and a few other things, and we'll share a link so you can watch it. It's silent. Makes sense. And black and white. Black and white. It's from the 20s. When I saw you watching that, I thought it was like a cheesy remake or something mm-hmm. because yeah I'm, I'm not used to seeing actual old footage like that but and it looks like they're in costume yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they're not <laughs> it's all just how it looked <laughs> <laughs> the milwaukee public museum has two ambassadors carla and carl who are two people who go around town in inflatable t-rex costumes And they've been seen doing yoga and other activities like mini golfing, being at the batting cages, playing ping pong, even helping a brewery make beer Mm. uh, around their town in an effort to connect with the community and get more visitors to the museum. And Carla and Carl are named for Carl Ackley, the quote unquote father of taxidermy and a museum employee in the 1880s. Cool. Yeah. That's a fun way to get more people to the museum. I didn't realize that the Milwaukee Public Museum was open in the 1880s. Yeah. That's like my hometown museum. (laughs) Did you go as a kid? Yeah, I enjoyed it. We recently heard about Jurassic Foundation, which gives grants up to $3,000 to students, postdoctoral researchers, and other scientists with limited funding opportunities who are researching dinosaur paleontology. So there's two granting cycles, and the next deadline is September 15th. So if you've got anything in the works, you should try it. Grants are paid out in U.S. dollars, and grantees are expected to publish their research. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and their website's jurassicfoundation.org slash grants. Thanks to Kevin, who shared this next one with us via Facebook. So Anna Rothschild, host of Gross Science, posted a video about how dinosaurs had intestinal parasites based on coprolites that have been found. Yeah. And roundworm and flatworm eggs have been found in coprolites, as well as an ancient malaria-like parasite string. Uh, Poor dinosaurs. And she also talked about trichomonosis, which is a parasitic infection that affects modern birds and can bore holes in their jaw. And sometimes, yeah, so some scientists think that they were similar to holes found in T-Rex jaws. Yeah, or their sensory canals. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Larry Kaplan, a man in Pennsylvania, is raising money for ALS, which is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease by dressing up as a dinosaur and surprising people. So Kaplan has been raising money for ALS for the last 20 years, and this round is going to benefit Hope Loves Company, which offer free camps to kids who have a parent with ALS or have lost a parent to ALS. So that's really nice. I don't know what it means exactly to surprise people. There wasn't too many details, yeah. but it's cool. Or what? how much of a dinosaur he's going to dress up like. I would guess the inflatable T-Rex costume. Probably. Yeah. The price is right. Yep. (laughs) 
Quick shout out if you're looking for some kids dinosaur books, Let You Go shared with us via Instagram about the World of Dinosaurs Fast Fact Book. And I don't know too much about it, but apparently you can find it in the dollar section of Target. Sounds like a good find. And according to Let You Go on Instagram, it seems pretty accurate and even has Archaeopteryx. So it could be worth checking out. It's meant for kids ages 6 to 9, but I think it's fun to look at the illustrations at any age. In Beatrice, Nebraska, police are looking for a stolen dinosaur-shaped bounce house. It's a brontosaurus bounce house, and it was part of a community carnival. And I guess an employee deflated the house and, and rolled it up for another group of employees to pick up. But when they arrived at the carnival, the bounce house and the blower pump were missing. Oh, no. I know, but the extension cord was still there. I guess they were in a hurry. The police investigator, Aaron Barnes, said that this is the first bounce house disappearance he's seen in 20 years at the department, and the bounce house weighs about 200 pounds and is six feet tall when it's rolled up. So it's not Mm. the easiest to carry. No, 200 pounds. That takes at least two people. Yeah. Although uh, in the article, one person was saying you could, I guess, just shove it under the back of a truck or something. Yeah, if you're strong. Seems like it'd be noticeable in the back of that truck. Yeah. The bounce house is known as the spacewalk dinosaur, and unfortunately, a replacement would cost the company $3,500, so hopefully they find it. That doesn't seem bad. Yeah. $3,500 for a brontosaurus-shaped bounce house? <laughs> Sounds awesome. I want one. <laughs> That's a bit too pricey for us. Maybe we can get one for my next birthday. Uh, it's a very expensive birthday present. Well, we don't have to buy it. We can just oh, rent, rent it. it? I don't know if our backyard is big enough. Front yard. Oh, front yard. Is our front yard big enough? (laughs) I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe we'll go to our park. We could take up some of the sidewalk. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) Next in the UK, Morrison's is selling dinosaur planters at five pounds a piece. They have a T-Rex and Kylosaurus and brontosaurus and planters come with a plant it looks like they come in gold silver and bronze apparently you can't order them online so you have to go to a morrison's and hope that they're still in stock and i've heard it's been very popular so they may be out of stock by the time you hear this but you never know pretty cool you can also 3d print dinosaur planters and then paint them gold silver or bronze yeah i guess you could but then you gotta get your own plant oh do those come with a plant too yeah huh That's not bad for five pounds. I know. Think of the savings. (laughs) (laughs) Next, the 82nd Airborne Division created a dinosaur photo illustration to celebrate their centennial week. And the image had a disclaimer. It said, quote, this is a graphic illustration and not an actual photograph of dinosaurs, end quote, because earlier they had posted a fake photo of paratroopers and the eclipse. And apparently some people thought that was real. So... This image shows three T-Rexes roaring at C-17 Globemaster three aircraft and paratroopers while the sun sets. And then there's some pterosaurs flying around. And the caption reads, want to know the real reason the dinosaurs became extinct? Jeez. (laughs) Yeah. It's a pretty well done image. I enjoyed looking at it. I could see maybe thinking that paratroopers and an eclipse were real, but thinking that dinosaurs... (laughs) Well, there's that photo of Steven Spielberg. In front of the Triceratops? Yeah. That he hunted so viciously? Yeah. Yeah. So you never know. That's true. Better safe than sorry. Next, you can now build a 3D chocolate T-Rex and eat it. Chocolate construction has made a mold where you can pour melted chocolate into the mold and make teeth, a spine, tail, ribs, and arms. And then once the chocolate's cool enough, you can assemble the pieces which is kind of similar to our cookies. We've got these 3D cookie cutter things, but uh seems like it could be less work. Yeah. The whole thing's only supposed to take five minutes, so yeah, definitely less work. Yeah. And the T-Rex looks kind of like a wooden model 3D puzzle thing, cool. except you can decorate your cakes with it and eat it, so I think that makes it better. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate Construction just finished raising $31,000 in Kickstarter, and they'll be sending out the rewards soon, and hopefully they'll start selling the molds directly so we can all get one. I know I want one. I might be able to 3D print one. <laughs> I mean, like, I could 3D print that face right now. I could tell. <laughs> <laughs> and last, I just want to mention, thanks, Stuart, who shared this with us via Facebook. 
Home Depot has dinosaur skeleton Halloween decorations. I don't know if it's all Home Depots or just select ones, but the photo Stuart shared looked pretty cool. That would definitely fit in our front yard, Garrett. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> it's bones, and uh, yeah, it totally fits the Halloween thing. It really does. Or we could paint one on the side of our house. Too much work. <laughs> <laughs> There's always some reason, isn't there? Yep. And before we go into our interview with Matt Barron, we want to quickly give a shout out to us, <laughs> the sponsor of this episode. And specifically, we're talking this week about our audiobook, What Happened to Brontosaurus, which mid-book we discovered that Brontosaurus was revived by Emanuel Shop. So uh, the ending had a sudden and dramatic change. <laughs> Which was fine, because that was great news. It was. It's a good thing that it happened right before the book was published and not right after. That would have been disappointing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to play a little clip from the book so you can get a little taste. The paleontologist who discovered and named Brontosaurus was Othniel Charles Marsh, but he didn't find the head, so they used what they thought was the closest relative, a Camarasaurus. Marsh had a rival named Edward Drinker Cope, and in the 1860s, the two started what is now known as the Great Bone Wars. During the Bone Wars, Marsh and Cope had a competition to see who could find more dinosaur bones. So there you go. There's a little beginning portion of the book. And it's, what, 32 pages? Is that how long kids' books are? Typically, yeah. Pretty short. In addition to audiobook form, you can get it in print form or in ebook form, and in the ebook form, it will read aloud to you and like highlight the words as it goes. If you're reading it on iBooks. Oh yeah, only on iBooks. But that's pretty awesome. It's a probably a good way to learn how to read some of these scientific terms if you're a kid. Let's be honest though, the kids already know how to pronounce all <laughs> these dinosaur true. names. Better than a lot of their parents, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> I know we did. <laughs> We have links to where you can purchase the book on our site at inodino.com, or you can also go to Audible or Amazon or iBooks. And iBooks is the one that has that fancy highlighting feature. Yes. And if you're a patron at the Spinosaurus level, you get that audiobook, as well as the Top 10 Dinosaurs of 2014 audiobook, as part of your patronage. And we're working on making more audiobooks, so there's that to look forward to. Yep, like the other Top 10 books and potentially some fancy dinosaur fiction in the future. And now on to our interview with Matt Barron from the University of Cambridge. So we're joined by Matt Barron, and he is the author of the somewhat controversial Ornithoscalida. Is that how you say it? Ornithoscalida, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's an old word by Thomas Huxley, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate using that because he's like one of my <laughs> paleontology heroes. Nice. Yeah, mine too. So that was, uh, yeah, I was very happy when I discovered that he'd already come up with the system. Yeah, it yeah. was really cool. And it basically, as a quick summary Traditionally, you've got dinosaurs going into Saurischia and Ornithischia, and now we're just kind of mixing that up a little bit. All the Ornithischians <laughs> and some of the Saurischians, the theropods, are in this new Ornithoscalida group. And then you've got sauropods and herrerasaurs and maybe some other weirdos over in their own group. <laughs> yeah, that, that about sums it up perfectly. Yeah, in fact, that would have been much easier than doing my talk today. That's <laughs> that's that's the gist of it. <laughs> but you had some new stuff today too. Uh, oh yeah, I I, just, I took today just to throw out some. It was just you know I I, I kind of you know the papers have the hard data in, um, and I just saw this as an opportunity to just really say the craziest thoughts <laughs> that have been lingering in the back of my mind for months that I really wanted to just test and uh it was it got a decent reaction so, yeah yeah it was all right <laughs> i like how you actually like incited people to like disagree <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're yeah. like yeah that was the reaction i was hoping for <laughs> yeah that, that, I, I knew that the opening line would be particularly controversial <laughs> sort of moving that, that group even further into the theropod group and just yeah i mean it, it got an audible gasp <laughs> which, <laughs> You know, you're know, doing something right if you're making the audience respond like that to something. So yeah, yeah, it was great. I actually, my favorite part of your talk was in the beginning when you said you kind of looked at Ornithischia and Saurischia and how everybody has always assumed that those go all the way back to the origins of dinosaurs. And you said, like, that seems overly simplistic, kind of, and it's just worth testing. And I, I think that was a wonderful way to look at the issue. 
It is. It's it's a strange thing in that um, we've been really sort of baffled actually by the order in which we discovered fossils. Mm -hmm. So we got this Cretaceous and Jurassic record from North America and Britain and Germany as well a little bit in, in the 1800s. And then, yeah, there's a simplistic scheme put forward by a Victorian scientist who didn't believe in evolution. <laughs> he grouped animals based on morphological similarity as absolute representations of God's designs. And mm -hmm. so he put these like, this is one box, this is the other box, and never the twin shall meet. <laughs> and the idea that in the 2017, we're still not challenging that like methodologically always perplexed me. Always, I always thought it's like a miracle that that stood the <laughs> test of time. Why hasn't it? But, the, you know, when we... When I started my PhD, we started looking at the questions of early dinosaur evolution, and the first thing I wanted to test was that, because I th there's just no way, there's no <laughs> way that, why would that be the case? Like, yeah, why would he have gotten it right, too? Absolutely yeah. spot on, yeah, that the common yeah. ancestor gave rise to two lineages that were these two lineages, and it just can, like, it would be weird if that was the case, it really would. That was based on, what, maybe 10 or 20 dinosaurs? How many was he working yeah, with? Yeah, he was working with maybe even less than that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as, ma as many as Huxley had when he did on the Scalida. Yeah. Maybe 15 at most. And yeah, n not in an evolutionary framework. And so, yeah, it's just, it's, it's baffling it's lasted <laughs> that long. And it's just because it's so ingrained, you know, why would you challenge it? And mm -hmm. it's comfortable. And like I said, people interpreted the fossil record in a certain way, expecting to see it. Yeah. And so we ca called all these things Triassic Ornithischians when they just weren't. Because we thought they have to be there, so... <laughs> Maybe this bit of tooth is, and maybe this thing is, and the more we've looked at that, we're like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, it was funny when you gave the talk and you were like, I want to keep saying there's no Triassic Ornithischians, but then before I even got to this talk, like two of them have already been like axed out by other people saying like, oh no, that's actually more like a crocodilomorph kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. well the, the, the record has just dwindled and dwindled by 10 years ago down to three, mm -hmm. and then down to two, and then Paisanosaurus, I was originally, when I planned this talk in my head about a year ago, <laughs> When I first had the result, I was going to say, and Pisanosaurus is dubious, it's, it's difficult to interpret, and whatever, but then Agnilin just took it out, and then my own data set, modified based on some other stuff, also took it out. I was like, oh, oh okay, that, that clears that up then. Yeah. <laughs> it saves me having to do like the arm wavy, because like, otherwise I'd be saying, my theory only holds if. Yep. Right. And now it's like, there are no Triassic <laughs> Ornithischians. I can say that with some confidence. So. Yeah, that's great. So the one thing that kind of perplexes me is you've got Chileosaurus, in your recent paper and like that was you call it a missing link <laughs> which i think is a little bit uh you know almost clickbaity but <laughs> we, were, yeah, we were doing the thing that editors like which is uh yeah it's it's like you said it's, it's clickbait for news and it, a journal editor reads that as oh yeah that's that's gonna get some interest that's it is kind of, i mean depending on how you look at it, it is kind of a missing link because it shows the relationship yeah but obviously it in terms of the actual period of time, we need to find something that's a lot older than that in order to actually show that link. Absolutely. Unless, like today, you pointed out that like the transition was like more with Neo... What is it called? Nevo Avarostra? Oh, there's, you, so yeah, you have the Avarostra, which are a, a derived group of theropods, and, and maybe it is that far in. I think I was really pushing the envelope <laughs> in terms of like how far can I can I push this idea? When? How um, far back would that be? If the beginning of Neo, it, it would still leave you a considerable ghost lineage for Chilesaurus because that is still quite a young taxon. Okay. But that being said, it's positioned currently as a very early Tetanurin, mm -hmm. which is still an early Jurassic radiation. So this, that ghost lineage exists no matter what. Chilesaurus was a living fossil in its time. It True, yeah. hadn't mm -hmm. changed much from its primitive condition yet. Was forty million years younger than the animals that it actually, the common ancestor it looked like. So gotcha. even if it's an Ornithischian, that lineage. Ghost lineage isn't a problem, but yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, my hunch is that Ornithischia is within Theropoda, uh, something that Paul laments because he spent his career saying Theropods are, you know, <laughs> the poster boys of the dinosaur world and they get too much attention and no one cares about Ornithischians <laughs> and Ornithischians are really the cool ones and oh man, we hate Theropods and then, oh, Ornithischians might be Theropods. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. So, yeah, there might be some more stuff that bridges that morphological gap between Chilosaurus and Ornithischia. Mm -hmm. And slightly further down that lineage again, so other missing links, you know, yeah. other steps in the in the story. And we, I'd hope some of those would be older and would be more consistent, more um, stratigraphically congruent, I think is the scientific term for, <laughs> for that. Yeah, that's cool. So I, I guess the title of like Chileosaurus shows that there's a ghost lineage that predetermines that there is a missing link at one point is a little bit too wordy. Yeah. So you just say it's a missing link. It's a little bit, yeah. And <laughs> That's it's not how you get people interested. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit, bit long and also just 
you know, er- technically every species in a tree is a missing link between yeah. the species below it and the species above it. Mm-hmm. But you make two new missing links every time. And you make two, yeah, <laughs> it's like a hydra, just for every uh, and, uh, one you answer, you get two new questions. It's yep. Barry Cox, who was a paleontologist in the 60s, 70s, back in London, had a great quote about Ornithischian evolution. And it ended with something about, and then the poor grad student, after four years of study, finds he knows less than when he started. <laughs> and I ended my thesis with that. It's just like, a, yeah, that's, that's pretty much, you'd nailed that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So one of the biggest problems that I've seen pointed out is people worry a lot about how to interpret old scientific papers when you kind of overturn things. So like one of the main reasons you don't rename things randomly is so that you can go back and when you read about it, you're like, okay, yeah, it always has the same name. I know what I'm talking about. So it becomes obviously more difficult (laughs) when you talk about like Ornithoscolida and you now have Theropoda within that Whereas other people, when they're talking about Theropoda, Mm. they're talking about something different. So I know Tom Holtz recommended calling Saurischia Pachypodosauria. Yeah, he really, (laughs) he dug through the histories to find that name. That was, uh, it was cool. I mean, it, yeah, so there is an argument to be made that Saurischia should just be allowed to die. In Mm -hmm. that, if Ornithischia, especially if Ornithischia is nested within Theropoda, we don't need something to say lizard hipped. Well, first of all, the lizard hipped concept all lizards have hips like that. So to mm-hmm. unite a group based on that, it's like, well, everything has lizard hips. <laughs> yeah. If they're in the, it, you know, archosaurs all have that hip, apart from the ornithischians. Mm-hmm. So I think Sauriscia will eventually be abandoned. But yeah, they're bringing back the Pachypodosauria is another viable alternative. It's, it, it is hard to maintain consistency. Uh, I yeah. think mm-hmm. a, as we get towards consensus on lots of stuff, it, things settle down. Yeah. So like, we're pretty confident that within the sauropod group, you've got, massive spondylids that's mm-hmm. pretty mm-hmm. consistently found by most people now within theropod you have aves which leads to birds mm-hmm. that name's going to stick now so yeah uh, but then you have idiots like me that come along and they're like <laughs> oh yeah this nice easily well established much agreed upon order let's just twist that and ruin that and change that so you stepped short of what some other people have done though like in dinosaur heresies bacher recommended just like getting rid of dinosaur you know just like really going out of left field so you're yeah. still kind of operating within a pretty traditional framework it's just where you put the different dinosaurs within dinosauria yeah i, I my work was already controversial enough and i didn't <laughs> want to say yeah dinosauria should just be abandoned and the other thing that could have happened is we could have based on current definitions or the old definitions said sauropods aren't dinosaurs because yeah, it, yeah. it used to be bird yep. and triceratops and mm-hmm. I just didn't want to I couldn't show my face at SVP <laughs> if I I told like a third of all attendees that come here that they've not been working on dinosaurs this whole time because <laughs> sauropods aren't dinosaurs I thought no I can't I can't do that so I am a traditionalist at heart and <laughs> the new definitions we proposed in the, in the nature paper we redefined all the clades it was to ensure that the groups that we know and love and we'd like the most to stay around forever like Mm -hmm. i didn't want to be the guy that killed dinosaurs that would be oh that would be just so sad (laughs) that would be so speaking of uh naming all the characters you started with 70 ish right from the early jurassic late triassic just so you're looking at that split Mm -hmm. because that's obviously where you care about when you're talking about you know where dinosaurs came from and then at the end of the talk, you were talking about adding more characters to kind of fill out the rest of that tree. So how many are you going to try to do? Uh, the ultimate aim um, one day is I would like to complete ideally a pan um tree, but perhaps not on my own. That's going to be collaborative. But certainly in my own input, every dinosaur from the whole of the Triassic, every dinosaur from the early Jurassic, and possibly every dinosaur from the middle Jurassic, hmm. or at least the first half of the middle Jurassic global coverage every species that's valid included which is about 400 to 500 species yeah which is like it took me four years to do 75 so it's gonna be (laughs) it's gonna be a heck of a job (laughs) so was was most of the work in doing that finding new characters and like all that kind of work yeah it was a combination so my first year was taking up re-describing the postcranial anatomy of an early ornithischian the Suchosaurus. Mm. that was my first task and that got me onto the thoughts about the phylogeny so then it was three years assembling the data and it was yeah traveling seeing the specimens deciding what characters were important i looked at sterling nesbitt's data sets serenos langer and benton contributed huge amounts richard butler mm. put together as many of their sets as i could looked at all of their work tried to see where they there was a di- agreement and disagreement mm-hmm took that stuff out with me when I went into the museums around the world and then looked at the specimens myself and okay they say this and they say this but based on what I've seen I think it's this so I'll 
until I eventually had this this big data set, and it just took time. It was a, a big yeah. spreadsheet. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Thirty thousand data points, um, <laughs> which each one I input by hand is either a one, a zero, or a question mark. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So I got to know that Excel spreadsheet pretty well. And I have uh, like 400 backup copies of it at various stages of completeness because I was paranoid about like yeah. one day yeah. switching it on and being like, where's it gone? <laughs> like, corrupted? What does that mean? <laughs> that would be awful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's interesting that people talk about like overturning science. I think I probably even use that term too. But really, it, you are building on all the previous work. It's, you know, the way science goes. A lot of times you head in one direction and then someone realizes, wait a second, we made a wrong turn somewhere back there, but we still got a lot of new information along the way and we can, you know, kind of reshape that. What kind of responses have you gotten from people? Are there any like really interesting responses? But let me just say, that's a great way of talking about it, actually. Like, even if you've been treading along the wrong path, mm -hmm. the data you pick up is still critical, absolutely yep. critical. And you can always find your way back home if you you know if you've been fastidious in collecting your data properly so yeah it's a good way of thinking of it we, we do know so much more about early dinosaurs way more than we did 20 years ago or a hundred and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly in terms of the response we've had obviously a lot of interest um anything that gets this much public and academic interest is gonna and yeah it's been it's been pretty good it's been collegial and very professional there are some people that have taken it personally mm -hmm. There have been some people that have been less pleased about the idea because it directly contradicts their lifetime's achievements. <laughs> Not so much, actually. The, the main cr vocal critics, from an academic point of view that I know, are people like Max Langer. But Max is a really nice guy. We've met, we've chatted, and he's not close to the idea. Nobody's close to the idea. That's what I found has been the nicest thing, is that hmm. people may just disagree. They may prefer the idea that ornithischians do diverge separately from the rest of the group in the Triassic. And that's fine, because that is also equally valid as a hypothesis. There are two hypotheses, but nobody so far has rejected my hypothesis without any evidence or grounds to do so. Everyone's been like, well, that is interesting. And I can see the evidence that led you to that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can see what we need now need to do to test it. So we're, let's do it. And people have been very positive. And actually, a lot of people have been talking about doing it together. Nice. So like, Great. oh, we should collaborate when we combine these data sets and see what we get. We should check notes. We should grab a beer and argue for seven hours about whether Guaibasaurus has this thing or not. <laughs> like, no, it's been good. It's been pretty good so far. Nice. Um, so then is it kind of just an argument over which traits are inherited versus which ones are kind of co-evolved? A little bit. Um, the software we use kind of tells you that a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. But again, it's dependent on how you input. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the main points of debate now are going to be people looking at what my anatomical character's that I looked at in these texts that actually say mm -hmm. what the strict definitions are in their head versus what they are in my head. And, you know, I might say this uh, animal has this feature and they will say, no, it doesn't. And that might be because either we interpret the bone differently or we interpret the wording of the character differently. Mm. Mm. So there's disagreement. Max has changed about 10% of my data himself in a version of the data set, mm -hmm. which is on its way. It's being published somewhere. And he's changed 10% based on his personal disagreements with either the wording or the interpretation of the bones. Obviously, we haven't had a chance to discuss any of it. So at some point, we'll have to sit down and maybe I'll say, oh, no, when I say this, I mean this. And then mm. he goes, oh, yeah, okay, I'll put that back. Or maybe he'll say, but don't you think this looks more like this than this? And I'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. Let's leave that as it is. So with time, we're going to sort of hopefully arrive at a consensus. But yeah, that's, that's the main cause of possible real contention is actually the data set itself. I think the analysis we did, we were pretty comprehensive. And we've run the model now through several other types of um, analysis as well. So we've used uh, Bayesian, which is much more statistically heavy. We've also used this cool new method whereby you put the animals basically on Pangaea with no tree. And then it does a phylogenetic analysis as Pangaea splits and moves apart. And mm -hmm. so it says like, these two things are on different continents and are thought to be related, but actually the divergence time from when they have to be, you know, based on when the continent split, mm -hmm. it means they must have been paired up back then and if that's not possible, so it's more likely that whatever. So it's a combination of Bayesian and biogeography, which is really cool. That is cool. So uh, a guy called Mike Lee is sort of pioneering that technique and he jumped on our data set. He's like, oh, this is great. Like I've, <laughs> I've been wanting to use a case study to test this out, so let's just do it. So we've got oh, that awesome. in review as well, that which is, is kind of cool. So are the results pretty similar or still don't know yet? Uh, in My data set holds up to Bayesian. Um, it comes out exactly the same. Same mm. topology. Ornithus collider lives through the Bayesian analysis. The, the tip-dated biogeographic stuff, we get a South American origin for Dinosauria, which is exactly what everyone has been saying for a long time, and that's fine. 
and no major changes in the tree. Mm. So yeah, the, now if people want to test out my data, it's going to have to be point by point. Like this is scored as a one, and I think it's a zero, and we'll just debate that endlessly in the <laughs> the literature for for years, or or we'll just do something like is being proposed tonight, which is meet up with Max and we'll sit and chat over a, a beer, and he'll tell me why th he thinks this is something, and I say it's not. So yeah, cool. Do you think we'll see anytime soon? Because I know like at the American Museum of Natural History, there's a big part of the room where they explain ornithischians and the, the lizard hip and the bird hip and things like that. I mean, how long till you think we see different explanations? <laughs> it, well, it's interesting. Well, the American Museum of Natural History has a hall that's mm -hmm. just ornithischia and mm -hmm. a hall that is just sauriscia. And <laughs> I don't think they're going to have to knock any walls through just to accommodate my theory. I wouldn't <laughs> expect that. But um, yeah, I mean, with time, maybe. Yeah, it took them until the 90s to put T-Rex with his tail off the ground. So, yeah, I mean. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and then feathers on things is, is only just creeping in. Still yeah. not in like the Jurassic Park movies. So like, yeah, it may never be. Um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe even it, maybe if it's just a little sign that then has a caveat underneath saying, oh, and there's also another suggestion. But we're not sure on that one yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the guy still has a lot to prove to make us convinced. But. A lot of the talks here though did mention Ornithoscelida yeah. and yeah. how like they adapted their data set to try to like account for that and things like that. So it seems like it's being pretty well, you know, represented by other scientific papers. It's true. Yeah, people have been quite good this year just to say, oh yeah, and we also had to test it within this hypothesis, given mm -hmm. that it's valid and it's not been proven to be wrong. And it does offer some nice solutions to some other things. Like, yeah. where are the Triassic Ornithischians? Ornithischelida could have the answer to that if we take one of the ideas that I put forward and, you know, we run with that. Did you see um, Pascal Godfra's talk about Kalindodromius having feathers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, early Jurassic uh, Ornithischian with feathers, and he was talking about early Jurassic theropods maybe being feathers going even that far down, and, uh, well, maybe that's a homologous feature of Ornithoscalida. We don't know, and that's, you know, the nature cover kind of hinted that a little bit with the, the Ornithischian looking wistfully at the flight feather of a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's cool to see people talking about it. The nicest thing would be if there was a talk next year that is, we built our own data set completely from scratch and replicated the results. Yeah. Or, you know, another type of analysis also finds Ornithoscalida. Like, Say someone does some geometric morphometrics on hip bones or something and mm -hmm. theropods and ornithischians group together, that would just be so sweet. Yeah, <laughs> it would be. It'd be very hard not to stand up at that point in the audience and be like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, but awesome. yeah, so it's cool. It's cool that it's being taken seriously, I think. It's quite good. Yeah, definitely. And we've heard that about some of the other like bigger science papers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just in general so it seems like that's how you know it's good <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like uh, you know Paul Serino gave some pretty harsh reviews of my work in the New York Times and mm -hmm. you know to be honest I, again I took that as a, a badge of honor you know <laughs> if a guy like that's taking time out of his day to have a swing at me it means I've <laughs> done something worth listening to at least you know yeah so yeah, yeah it's, it's nice that it's been picked up cool well thank you very much for sitting down to talk with us yeah and thank you getting me to say Ornithus Galida correctly rather than Ornithus Celida, which is what we've, I've been saying. We've been wondering. <laughs> uh, some people do leave it as a soft soft C, um, but it's I think it's because it's from the Greek skelios, yeah. which is a hard, it's a K actually in Greek, so I think it, you hit the C hard. Since you revised it, you know, or revived it, I'll just take your word for it and go with that. I way. could be wrong. I, I pronounce all sorts <laughs> wrong in... in uh, cool. but, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. It's really interesting and keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the interview, Matt. We're really glad we got to meet you in person. Yeah, it was a great interview. And thanks for being a good sport when I threw some slightly difficult questions at you with no warning. <laughs> and now on to our dinosaur of the day, Piatnitskisaurus, which was a request from Dinosaur4602 via YouTube. So thanks. It was a megalosaur theropod that lived in the Jurassic and what is now Argentina. And two partial skeletons have been found, including a fractured skull. The fossils were collected in 1977, 1982, and 1983, but it was described in 1979 by Jose Bonaparte. He described a lot of stuff. He Keeps did. popping up in our dinosaur of days. Well, I guess Argentina is his region. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the type species is Pietnitskisaurus floresi, and the name means Pietnitsky's lizard. It's named in honor of Alejandro Pietnitsky, who is a Russian-Argentine geologist. Pietnitskisaurus was a medium-sized dinosaur with a light build. It was a bipedal carnivore, and it could be up to 14.1 feet or 4.3 meters long and weigh 990 pounds or 440 kilograms. 
The holotype found is a subadult, so it may have grown even larger. It had strong arms and legs and four toes in each foot. It probably hunted small dinosaurs, and it probably also scavenged. It has a similar brain case to Pivichusaurus, a theropod found in northern France. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place as Piatniskisaurus include Eobelosaurus, an abelosaurid, Patagosaurus, and Volkheimeria, eusauropods, and Tehuelshosaurus. And for our fun fact of the day, we've already gone through a lot of really heavy science stuff with SVP and everything, so it's going to be a little bit of a lighter fun fact. And if you heard that little snippet from Sabrina's book, What Happened to Brontosaurus, and you wanted to hear something else about the Bone Wars, well, a fun fact is that Cope, when he died and inspired by his rivalry with Marsh, decided that he wanted to donate his skull to science so they could measure his brain, specifically weigh his brain, and then he challenged that when Cope died, Cope do the same thing, and they would find out whose brain weighed more. This is back when they thought the bigger the brain, the smarter you were. Yeah. So he wanted to like have this final challenge <laughs> posthumously. But the funniest thing is they weighed Cope's brain and recorded the weight. But then when Marsh died, he just said, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be any part of this. I don't really blame him. <laughs> Which I really think is the way to win that battle, just to outlive your counterpart and then... And not take the bait. Yeah. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And again, if you want to join our growing community of dinosaur enthusiasts, check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.